Hi, everyone. Good morning. Today, we have an amazing guest on our podcast from Netherlands. So hi, Hilke. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hilke Britstra. Indeed, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I'm working as an uh, FNO consultant and trainer. Um, and I share a lot of finest topics regarding FNO on LinkedIn. And I think that's why I was invited uh, in this podcast. No, thanks for joining us. And today we have something new. So we have Alicia Keener joining us as a co-host. So thanks for joining, Alicia. How are you doing? It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Ragnar. Yeah, awesome. So today I want to talk to Hugo more about. Uh, so Hugo, could you have could you share us how you first got involved in a Dynamics 365? Uh, what was it about AX or D365 that has captivated your interest to uh, and help us understand how you got into it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Um... Yeah, when I started, it was Accepta. Uh, it was in 2006 that, that uh, I had my first introduction with, uh, with the application. Um, that was at a side job where I worked during my study. Uh, that company implemented Accepta 3.5. Um, and more and more, I got involved by working in the system. So first it was um, yeah, doing some side jobs for people. Uh, they didn't have the time to finish their jobs. And I did that when I had some time off. Um, and uh, more and more, I got focused on the system and how to work with the system. So I got questions about, can you make work instructions for us? Um, uh, because I could be scheduled for that kind of tasks. Uh, later on, they want some optimizations and they ask me, can you describe what we want? Can you um, ask the requirements for it? Can you make a document so that when we are going to our partner uh, to ask if they can create it, that we have the information available. Uh, so I started to yeah, write down requirements, uh, talk with people about what they needed. Um, later on, it, it was like the functional design documents that I created for that company. And I had the discussions with, with the partner that we had, how to make it and um, yeah, test it and, and roll it out by, by the people who had to work with it. Um, so step by step, I, I became more involved by, by Accepta at, at that company. Um, more and more projects came, uh, the company changed. So new things needed to be added in Accepta as well. Um, and at the end, after a couple of years, I was responsible functionally for, for that system and also uh, the other systems at that company. Um, and yeah, it, it's my interest there was uh, especially the combination between the business, the processes and the goals of the company, the people who had to work with it and the tooling, uh, the, the Accepta itself. So the combination of these three area, um, yeah, that was where I got interested. Also, because I remember um, that when the implementation was finished, um, that there was like uh, a moment where they celebrated um, the go live of Aksaba. And I was invited as well. Um, and I was there and some people were angry because they celebrated the go live and they said, but it doesn't work like how I need it. So it was already my first experience that ERP implementations are sometimes more difficult than you can see at first sight. And also that got my interest. Why is it so, so difficult for, for them to accept it? And what happened? So all these, these aspects of working with an ERP tool like Accepta, uh, Finance and Operations, um, and the process of implementations, um, yeah, got more and more my interest. And in that company, my role became more or less more like um, project manager and more I had to manage the projects of the things that needed to be changed in, in the systems like Accepta. And more and more I realized that that was not what I wanted because I was there to manage the discussion, but I wanted to discuss about the solution, but that was not my role anymore. So then I decided to, uh, yeah, I wanted to do more with the tooling itself, with Accepta and, and all the, the later versions and being able to, to help with creating good solutions, make the combinations with business and people. And that was the moment that I started searching for a place where I could do more with, with Accepta. 
and that was also the moment that I ended up by Emprise, where I work at the moment, where I work as trainer and consultant with, uh, well, mostly uh, finance and operations uh, at the moment. AX2012, and sometimes we have a customer which works with an older version, I still support them. Um, and still it has my interest because the combination of, of business, people, and the tooling, finance and operations, still is a triangle yeah, where you can do a lot and help a lot and where a lot needs to be done, I think, in, uh, in the projects. You know, Hugo, you brought up a good point about that in 2006, whenever you were going through this process, there's a very much of an emotional journey yeah. in ERP. Yeah. And I think as a consultant, I know I was in the same boat as you when I first started out. I didn't, it was all about the technology and all about the tool and all about the business. And I really didn't take the human factor into it. Yeah. And I very quickly learned like this is an emotional journey for people because they've been using the same system for 20, 30 years. And all of a sudden it's like you move their cheese, like, you know, so as you've gone through your career, you probably have seen a lot of transition and growth in yourself and how you do your training. Are there any things that you advise that you would give other people that are doing implementations and training on that emotional yeah. journey or how to help the tr users transition? Yeah, I think what I see at the moment, I always say it's all about people. So even if you are implementing the tool, you, you can buy the best car in the world for someone, but if they are not able to drive or if they are not willing to drive, they will maybe crash the car. And then still you can say it was a good car, but not in that situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same for ERP tooling like finance and operations. It can do a lot. Um, uh, you can configure a lot to make it consistent for the company that needs to use it. But if you forget the people that are going to work with it, um, yeah, you, you can have a lot of frustration, you can make mistakes, and at the end, people need to feel the responsibility to make it a success. And that success, I think, still always comes from, from the people that are going to use it. I see in projects more and more that change managers are involved, um, that are going to look at the human part, to the emotions, to how to prepare people for the decisions they need to make. Also, how to prepare people for introducing them to the new system. What do they need to learn? But also, where do they need to commit to, to be able to make that step and talk about what do they need for that? Um, so I think more and more in projects that human factor is involved in the scope, where I think when I started in the working area, it was like it is the tooling and the rest will follow automatically. That was the expectation. Right. So, yeah, and I think it's a good thing that, that you have to focus on people as well. Because, yeah, I speak a lot of people in trainings and in consultancy, and some of them are just scared. They are scared yeah. about what will happen with my job, what will happen with what if I'm not able to, to work with that new system. Mm -hmm. Also in the company where I started, one of the employees didn't came back because the Accepta 3.5 was too big for her. Um, she just had to work six months before um, uh, they would end her career. And that six months, she could not find the energy to come back and work with Accepta. The change was too big. So there I immediately saw you have to focus on people as well, even if I can understand that if the deadline is coming yeah, the first step maybe is focus on the tool. That is your first reaction, but still it's always in combination with the business and people, because if that triangle is not in balance, yeah. then even if you have the tool finished, maybe you will not have a successful uh, go live or first months working with the tooling. Yeah, I love that. And I love your heart of compassion towards the yeah. people. And I even noticed that, by the way, in your blog post, um, there, you, you have a heart of compassion and care and it comes through. It comes through your words. It comes through, you know, how you do your projects and stuff. It's really, really good. Um, oh, and as far as, like, as far as the product goes, we're transitioning now into this AI world. Yep. So, and I know you've seen a lot of change from 3.5 to D365. So yep. are you, have you had a chance to look into the AI piece of it? And how do you see that maybe transforming the way we do our work? Yeah, I, I have seen some of the options um, when it comes to supply chain management, because for finance, uh, it's not available already in Europe for all places. So uh, I was not able to check, for example, the 
collections coordinator workspace because that is really in the finance area and, and I want to use it, but I'm not uh, able to at the moment. I have seen uh, some options in, in supply chain management, uh, like the confirmed uh, purchase order changes, um, um, a, a workspace that came where changes after the confirmation of the purchase uh, orders are checked in relation to the scheduled production orders, the safety stock, and that the system will, will uh, see the low impact or high impact changes on your process based on the changes that are made in the purchase order. Um, creating emails to vendors if you cannot accept the change based on the effect. And I think um, the transition for that kind of options can be done really smoothly because um, uh, it's intuitive. The, the email will be created based on AI and you still have an option to check it. Um, so in that situation, that smaller parts, I think um, people will get used to it because if it comes in small steps, they don't even realize that they are introduced with AI. I think it's a bit different with, with Copilot in, in FNO, where you say I, I can um, ask questions. Um, for example, I uploaded all my work instructions and people can chat with Copilot to ask them, how do I need to do that process in our company? In that case, people are starting to work at another way. I think there you need to guide them more about how are you going to ask good questions? And what does it mean for the outcome? It's the same for, for the image creator that Microsoft um, um, uh, presented a lot and you could create your own images. And uh, I wrote a post on LinkedIn where I said, I, I have two prompts. One is a house. And the second prompt was a house near a lake with at the background the mountains and in the garden, the roses bloom. And the outcome were two total different images, of course, because the prompts were different. So you need to learn people what kind of prompts, what kind of questions do I need to ask to get the outcome I need? And I think there you have to help people. Um, yeah, how, what does it mean for your daily job and how can you use it in that way? But at the other hand, um, yeah, I also see that some of the changes with AI are coming in step by step. And I think then people can get used to one step and can make the next step. Don't make it too big. Do it step by step. Uh, and I think that helps people always. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah. No, thank you. Okay. The other thing also, like you were mentioning a couple of things. I was reading this book called, uh, what is it called? Building Model Generation. Basically in that he speaks about like, one is empathize with your customer that you have learned from your first project. That's good to know because I'm very young <laughs> to accept or something, but to understand that these are the problems of customer. It's not about the tool, right? Sometimes if you don't, uh, one of the one of the key things is write scenarios with your customer as a protagonist, right? Yep. Your customer has to be the hero of the product, not the product has to be hero of the company. Yeah. Uh, that's the key thing that most people miss. And at Morgan Franklin or where I work now as well, one of the key things is we take change management and we also take uh, uh, training very important as part of any implementation. Some of the times what I noticed is a lot of the companies the training or change management is last two slides in a company. Yep. And that's where companies yep. are unable to adapt. Implementation is easy. Adaption is the hardest thing. So if you yeah. can build that, that's where yep. you can. And succeed. if training and if training is in the last two slides and the planning will not be reached, it means that focus mm -hmm. will go on the tool and training will be skipped because if you have the tool, at least we can work. And I have a different opinion. Of course, you need the tool. But being able to work is not only to have the tool, but also being able to work with the tool and understand the tool. Um, and yeah, I, I say it more and more. I, I really like the tooling where I work in. Uh, finance and operations, you can do a lot. And I share a lot. And even what I share is a small part of, of what in finance can be used. So let's if you take it in total and take the landscape. It's even more than I can ever know, I think. Um, so the tooling, you can do a lot, but if you look at a company, um, I've never spoke to a CEO that said on birthday parties, I'm telling people that I have FNO. They never <laughs> do. 
They maybe they do it with their car. They're proud of their new car, but they will never tell, oh, I'm so happy I have ever no, no, they see it really as a tool. And it's like if you are, even if they buy a new machine in their production factory, for example, they even can talk more proud about that machine because you can see it, you can feel it, you can walk around it, than the tooling ever know. And of course, it is an important tool. Sometimes I say by companies where you have discussions about the relevance of ERP, I say, okay, turn it off for a week and then we talk again. Then we will have another discussion, but still it is a tool. It will not save your company, not the tool only, but having the tool can support your business processes on a way that you need. It can help you to reach your company goals, but still it is a tool and people need to learn how to deal with it. It's a fact, I think. Understood. I know a lot about, like, I remember when I followed you or started looking at you, I was looking for some articles and then every time I said something, your your articles come up. But before we go more technical, I think there was a lot of information already. I would love to know a bit more about you, even the community, yeah. I guess. Uh, can you share some other hobbies or passions that you have so people can understand how you ca- where you come from and what kind of a person you are, maybe? Yeah, of course. Yeah, nice. Um, well, I I, uh, I live in the Netherlands in uh, in a small town uh, called Nijkerk. It is like uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes from, from Amsterdam, but we live in, in a smaller city. Um, I'm married, having three quite little kids. One is four, one is five, and the oldest one just became eight. So we... Uh, we have like a, a busy family, uh, also uh, a brown Labrador dog uh, of seven. So, well, we have a lot, of, a lot of coziness in our house based on the fact that, well, enough to do. Um, and if you talk about what is important for you, then I think that that is very important for me. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I know you have questions about being MVP as well, but I always say I only can be MVP in the Microsoft area if I'm a good MVP at home, I'm the most valuable papa for them. And, <laughs> and that is important for me because if, if I cannot be MVP at home, then the rest makes no sense. That's, that's my first priority. Um, and I really like it, spending time with my kids, uh, walking with a dog in the nature. That, that are things uh, I really uh, like. And I think writing in common has my heart. So um, I, I write more than, than doing sessions, I think. Um, that also had to do with my family situation because when I started sharing, um, our youngest one was one, the second was two, and the oldest was four. Um, so I w- did not have the energy to leave the home at night to give sessions or something. I was already ha- happy if I had slept five hours a night. Um, but writing was something I could do when I had some time. And I, I didn't know when, but if I had time, I could start writing. Um, and that was writing in common. So I, I started writing about FNO, but also I wrote a book for the dirt market, a study book about Bible study. Um, that also has, has a question of mine based on my faith. And, um, that was a, a study book about how to do Bible study, uh, also in groups. And I'm also volunteer uh, as a mentor for Global Rise. And that is an, a non-government organization, um, um, uh, where on internet you can do Bible study and you have a mentor that will guide you and I, I'm a mentor. Also something where you write a lot. Um, so I think writing in common uh, is one of my passions. Okay. Is the Bible study in English or is it uh, Dutch? Or... Yeah. Yeah, that Bible study is, is in English because they um, uh, the, the course is worldwide. So um, you have okay. like in English, in Spanish, uh, but... I cannot do that. So I'm yeah. doing the English uh, for Ryan. Yeah. Okay. Global rise as well. So uh, yeah. also like, I know for sure, like English is the common language everywhere, but, uh, yeah. uh, but also one of the key things is like, uh, just to get to get back to you, like when you started, did you start in the finance sector and then you were able to adapt to accept or <laughs> how was your education? Yeah, that's before? quite a funny story. <laughs> I yeah. started with a study financial services management, but that that is finance, but it is uh, more or less the yeah managing the private financial situation of, of people. Um, okay. Then I went for a year to a Bible school and after that I studied theology. So 
I did a lot, but it was not IT related. But all that time I worked at that company where I started with um, because, because I did 10 years of study. I needed a side job, but I could not do a full time job. And they always said, oh, you can come back for these amount of hours in a week because based on each study, I had to choose how many time I had to work. I always uh, could be flexible with them. Um, so even if the study studies were not exactly IT related, my my job became more and more IT related. So it's it's yeah. Um, it so, fell in place for the right. Yeah, person, yeah that, that was it. Yeah. Right time at the right moment. Right yeah. moment. No, and also, I think I don't have kids, but Alicia does. And maybe I just have two dogs and I don't know. I don't know want to do anything, but I think everyone will be angry that you said that you start writing when you have three kids. And I'm like, everyone's like, we don't have time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe um, it is. I think I, I'm a person having a lot of energy and that helps. And at the other hand, um, it gives me energy to write. So it was really something I enjoyed. After a busy day, it gives me energy to write something. So that helps. Yeah. It keeps your mind up other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I need it to get things out of my mind because I do so much, think so much that it helps me to write things down. That makes complete sense. And I know before we jump with Alicia, I have one more question that's thinking about. I think your passion for community and contribution, I can see your empathy for other contributors and other members. I think it all comes from like, what you said about your spiritual side or uh, like being that Bible study or uh, like being something close to different aspects of your life, right? I think that shows your compassion through that for other creators as well. So can yeah. you help us understand like, what, how did you even start about like thinking about the community and others more uh, before it's for your own team? Because part of the teams I work with people, they do a lot of things, but they're afraid to get to community or reach out. Yeah, how yeah. How did you get really start for you? I recognize that, yeah. Um, well, for me, it started, I think, also with my first job. That, that was a big fundament of my career, I think. Um, because at that moment, I had to learn a lot because I was in the beginning of my 20s and I was asked things to do in Accepta. I didn't know how to do that because uh, I never got training of Accepta. I just had to find out and they said, oh, we have a book. Maybe you need to re read that book about Accepta. So I started reading, but yeah, they're, they're not every best practice is mentioned. So I'm, I went to test and of course, in that time, Google became my best friend as well. I started mm -hmm. Googling questions, how to do this. And I was very happy if I found a video or if I found a blog of someone that described the topic where I searched for. Um, it helped me because I needed input to make the decisions for the implementations of topics I needed to. Um, so. At that moment, I already realized uh, the community is important because if people um, um, share their time with others with content that helps, um, yeah, that is important because I really enjoyed it and I liked it and it helped me. Um, when I started working at Emprise um, in my job interview, I was asked, what do you know about finance in AX if you have to tell a percentage? How much do you know? And I said, oh, I think 90% of finance in, in Accepta is familiar for me. What I didn't realize that I had to say, I know 90% of finance in the company situation where I work. But yeah. when I got questions from other companies, they asked questions of functionalities I had never seen. Um, um, they used AX very different. Um, we worked with Accepta 3. The companies that I needed to guide worked with AX 2012. That was at that moment the newest version. So, well, the first week I was a bit confused. I, I thought I knew a lot, but I knew a lot of that situation where I came from. At that moment, again, I, I of course, I'm working at the training company, so I could follow all the trainings that they, they give. And um, I did a lot of trainings, but then if you have to deal with questions or if you have to figure things out, um, I used Google again to see how am I going to do this. And of course, we had Microsoft materials that I didn't have at my previous job, but 
also then I have watched so many videos. I have read so many blogs when I started working or where, when I need to get my certifications. I, I was evenings watching movies, testing things. So the community was important because that people were sharing things that helped me. And then the point came a couple of years ago that I realized that I was in that position now, that I knew a lot and that I have in every conversation, people ask me, how am I going to do that? And that was the point of realization that I thought, okay, now, now it's time to give things back to, yeah, to the community as well. And that was the moment when I started writing. Awesome. I love how you want to give back and it, you know, it's, I think again, it goes back to your heart. Um, and I'm a person of faith too. And it's just one mm -hmm. of those things you realize that the world is about people. Yep. And everything else is superficial in many ways. You know, the product is a tool. Yep. Business is how you can help your client be the hero to service their clients better. Yep. So we're in the people business. And so I know that you're a Microsoft certified trainer, an MCT and an MVP, which I think yep. is a unique combination. I don't think there's a lot of people that have that. But do you feel as if that's what really fueled your desire to become, become an MVP and and MCT is your desire to give back and to share with people or what kind of fueled that for you? Yeah, I think there are two different ways there. MCT uh, was a prerequisite of my job because um, I became trainer and consultant and uh, they knew that I did not have the level already when I came at Emprise, but they say we give you the trust to find out and to go to work at it. And at the end, we want you to give trainings as well. And well, if you want to give trainings, uh, that's possible and after some time you need to become MCT because we want our trainers to have that to show also outside that we have trainers that that manage the tooling well and are recognized by Microsoft for that. So um, at the beginning it was first get my certification of finance and, and in that situation I also did the certification of supply chain management for AX 2012. Um, and later I, I did the MCT uh, enrollment because that, that was necessary for my job. Sure. When I st oh, sorry. Yeah, no, good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for MVP, it's a bit different because when I started sharing, I, I never realized that I ever could be MVP. That was never my purpose. So I, I just thought I'm going to share. And if I help two people or five people, I'm happy because I helped someone. Yeah. Of course, the. Well, it exploded a bit. I always say it like that because um, uh, the, the articles because became more and more, um, um, yeah, how do you say, more and more people read the articles. It was shared more and more. So, of course, I realized that, that more and more people um, uh, yeah, uh, used my articles when they are going to do the certifications or when they have questions. But still, I never realized that MVP could be an option, to be honest. So that was never a purpose. But of course, uh, when Bilor nominated me, I was I was proud and, and I thought, OK, that's already great. And still, I said I will never become MVP. I don't know why, but that was in my mind. Um, so um, when I got the email that I got it, I was really surprised and happy, of course, because it's an honor. But uh, I never expected it, to be honest. Yeah. So, you know, it's a beautiful thing when you speak to one, you speak to many. Yeah. You know, so yeah. when you're doing your blogs, you know, you're really speaking to, you know, you don't know if you're speaking to one person or 5,000 people, yeah. you know, but you're putting yourself out there and you're giving yourself, you're giving back yeah. and you start, it just snowballs, right? I mean, it's yeah, really, yeah. It I mean, really is. I mean, it's a really cool, cool, yeah. cool experience. Fantastic. Yeah. And what Regna says about people are sometimes afraid to share their knowledge outside. Yeah. I, I can imagine that. Of course, by the first articles that I wrote, I was really like reading them 20 times again. Is everything I write correct? Did I use the right words? And now, yeah, of course, I don't want mistakes, but if I have a small mistake in an article, people are sending me a message or having a comment, you say this, but don't you mean this? And then I say, yeah, you're right, I change it. Because yeah, everybody makes mistakes. That yes. that's, should not be the biggest point. But sometimes I think a lot of people which have the knowledge, I think, or they are really afraid about what people will, will say mm -hmm. about their content. Um, and the second thing is that people prioritize and say, I don't want to. Well, that, that's a choice they can make. But I think that are the main 
um, reasons for sharing or, or not sharing. Sure. And I think it's really important to remember, too, that fear will hold you back. Yeah. And faith will push you forward. Yeah. And so and I know, like, even like on our teams internally, I'm trying to encourage people to blog and different things. And again, same thing. They bring up the fear factor. Like, what if I don't get a good response? Or what if I yeah. can't post this frequently? Or what if, what if? Yeah. And I'm like, just do it. I mean, because, again, you don't know who needs to hear your voice today. Yeah. Um, so it is giving back is, is such a beautiful thing. And you do a great job at that. Yeah, and I think uh, also what you see is that FNO uh, is growing and growing uh, in combination with the landscape. It is much growing. It's not doable by some people because there is so much to share. So I, I, will inv I would invite everybody that has the feeling maybe I can help by sharing, just start. Because if you share relevant information, even if it helps five people, it is worth it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think the key thing is from what I learned is I think it will be helpful for anyone starting young is you mentioned that very clearly, Huke is like, you know, whatever you know at your company. That's the key thing to remember. This is how I have done. If you yeah. want to talk about procure to pay or if you want to write about it, just to mention this is how we are doing at our company. Every company does it differently. Yeah. Every tool does it differently. So just imagine that if so, don't worry about other people, just write what you are doing and what you have been exposed yeah. to. And that might be a best solution for someone who's doing it differently, right? Yeah. And might not be the right fit. And if someone doesn't know if it's the right fit or not, that's their problem, not yours. <laughs> yeah, and if it helps you, then indeed say the context about why you have chosen this setup. Maybe you say in our company uh, or in this project with this context, this helps. And if someone needs another solution based on a different context, they maybe with your information, they can do that as well. So. Yeah, I think fear never should hold you back to, to write and share. Um, um, and of course, um, uh, you can always start with the things where you can write the most about. So I would advise people that will start sharing, don't pick the most difficult topic you have seen. Just start with the topics you can share about with a lot of input. And then step by step, you can think about other topics or issues that you want to share. Yeah. The other thing I was always thinking was every time I feel like an imposter syndrome because I want to write something, but Alicia has done it or you have done it. And I feel like, should I write again? But sometimes I just need to stop thinking like that. And yeah. I'm also learning to say people, uh, it's easy to tell other people, but to adapt to myself is the hardest thing I'm trying to do. Yeah. And I think um, I, I have that same situation as well. Sometimes even I wrote the article already and um, uh, sometimes I write like uh, three articles in a week because I'm in the flow and then I'm writing and then I think, okay, in the next week I can share them. And of course, in week two, someone else is sharing the exactly same topic. Um, and I think, okay, yeah, I have my article ready. Should I share? Sometimes I don't. Then I write a message and I link it to that article because I have read it and it's okay. And then I say, why should I share my article? Because this is exactly what I would write. And sometimes I think I have just a different point of view. So I share it, people can compare. And also let's be honest, everybody has their, uh, the community that is reading your blogs, but you will not reach everybody. Nobody can. So even if I share and, and let's say a thousand people will read it, um, somebody else that shares will reach maybe 50 other peoples or 2,000 other peoples. So for me, um, never be each other's competitor. It's always, um, yeah, you can strengthen each, strengthen each other. Awesome. No, I think it's all about the community too, right? So that's what we are here. Like, even for me, I was thinking it's not my podcast. It's like, a, I want to bring other people as co-hosts so we can have like each one supporting each other. And we all can like, yep. uh, because you shared a lot of uh, great things. Like one of the first thing I remember writing you was I was about to like use your article and I said, hey, do, hey, UK, do you mind if I want to share this with some of the people in my company? And you're like, as long as you mention, it's great. And that's yep. all it takes. And and so it, it took me a lot of courage even to say hi to you, because sometimes you have that fear, like, 
I don't know what they will think, uh, but uh, you, you have been very like uh, humble and very, very polite and very uh, pleasing to talk to her, even on chat. So I feel like everyone should reach out to you at least to say hi, because sometimes we use a lot of information from other collaborators and other members who are sharing, but we never ever like say thank you or anything, because we always say like, thanks, like uh, thumbs up is enough. But sometimes I, when I used your article, I just felt like, Okay, I'm doing a lot of, uh, um, you done, you've done a lot of lifting for me, and I mm -hmm. felt like I'm just uh, uh, taking your credit. So I wanted to at least say thank you, and that's how we started. Uh, mm -hmm. And I feel like everyone should do it. <laughs> yeah, and of course, it is always nice to hear back when when things help people. Also, to, to see what are the topics that are needed the most or the areas that are needed the most. Um, I get a lot of, of reactions also in private messages uh, with, with thank you and I always appreciate it because of course it's nice that you put effort in it and that it is used and that it helps people. That is nice. Um, and I think, um, yeah, we are all human. So everybody is, it is important to have that contact and it doesn't matter if you wrote thousand articles or you shared one or you just use it and, and you say thank you. I think it's all even important. Yeah, and Alicia shares a lot too. So yeah. I know that's how I kind of met her. And for everyone who's thinking of just starting or even say thank you to all the people who are creating, it's great. And it takes a lot of energy and effort and not for Hugh because he's just writing on his a free time with his kids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, before we jump, I think about your MCT and your company, right? So one of the key things I'm just learning yesterday, you were speaking and one of your recent article about certification. So uh, what kind of things do you guys do and how, what is your kind of, uh, maybe your job that people can yeah. reach out for help or companies can reach you or your company. So what yeah. do they do and what do you guys do? Yeah, well, I work at the uh, Prize uh, Academy and in our Emprise Academy, we uh, we give um, more than 80 dynamics trainings um, um, uh, in mostly in Dutch. So for the Dutch market, it's quite a big AX and FNO market in the Netherlands. Um, uh, so we give like trainings for finance and operations, like finance training, supply chain training, production trainings, development trainings, but also based on Power Platform and Business Central. So really the dynamics applications is where we give trainings in. Um, and besides that, we also do um, um, projects related to FNO. Uh, there I'm a consultant. Um, and when we do the projects, we are not an implementation partner, so we don't sell the licenses and start from the beginning, but we are a lot involved at companies that went live and they want to optimize or they have problems and well, they, they want someone that helps them to, to solve that problem and make sure that, that that problem will not come back anymore. So we do a lot of, of projects related to uh, FNO. Um, sometimes during implementations, but um, in our combination, it is always um, training or consultancy, and in my case, always related to to FNO. And I have colleagues that are doing that for, let's say, uh, Power BI or or other things. But I'm really focused on finance in FNO. So that's one part of our company. And the second part of what we do is um, guiding and having workshops in the implementation uh, steps that you will face. Um, and like I said, my experience with the first implementation was that, well, it was called a successful implementation during the meeting and during the same meeting, I spoke to people that were very angry about that. And well, I was, okay, there, there is something with ERP implementations. Um, and we see that as well. I see a lot of companies struggling with ERP implementations. So in our unit, we also have workshops like, what does it mean to be a key user? That's, that's a workshop about, uh, for key users, what is your responsibility? What is your role? And how are you going to achieve that with all the activities that you are going to do? But also workshop like train the trainer. If you have to train your colleagues with a new application, uh, workshop testing. What if you are going to test? What, how are you going to do that? Um, so that's, that's quite like training, but we don't use the application there. It's more about the implementation uh, steps. Um, and also we do consultancy in that part. So we can guide organizations that are facing problems in ERP implementations or in a test phase, or uh, when they want a plan for learning or change, 
uh, we can guide them and help them uh, in, in well making that work. So yeah, it's like learning and doing projects is what we do in, in our academy. Awesome. No, that sounds great. And uh, one of the key things is, like you mentioned, so basically you're like an advisory slash uh, uh, consulting partner for companies if they are already there or if they have, if they need impre- uh, what do you call a process change or improvement of process or stuff like that. So you, you in training, you were mentioning user training. Do you train the users and the consultants as well or yeah. uh, user training is separate as well? Okay. Yeah, I, I it, the... It it can be anyone. So we have like the tra- the open trainings, and everybody that wants the training can just um, um, submit uh, to that training. So it can be that in one training that we we have a training uh, building as well. So we have our own classrooms here, um, okay. and it can be that if I have ten participants, that there are three consultants from the from the Netherlands and Belgium, for example. Uh, five key users, two end users, and a CFO that wants to understand the system to make the correct choices. So that that is very different. Um, sometimes we have uh, we know that we we call that the customer specific trainings that a customer wants a specific training for their situation. Like the key user team needs to be trained for finance for that company, or end users needs to be prepared for what happens after go live, um, or consultants needs to get certified. And they want me as the certification trainer that helps them to go through all the topics that are necessary for, uh, well, in my situation, the MBA 310 uh, exam. So the people that are following our trainings have very different needs, um, but we will make sure that, that well, all that uh, needs will be covered during our training. And that if it's very specific, we will have a specific group for that needs. Have you noticed that a lot of companies implement like Power Apps and other parts of the Microsoft stack along with D- with FNO? Or yeah. what are you seeing in that in that area as far as like Power Apps and Copilot and those kinds of things? Yeah, Copilot, I don't see it a lot at the moment. Um, I think it's it's quite new and and well, is it all available on every place? Well, at least in combination with FNO, I'm talking about. Um, when it, when you talk about Power Apps and Power Automate, I think um, well every implementation where I'm will be involved at this moment has something with Power Apps or Power Automate. So I think the the implementations at the moment always have some part with Power Apps and Power Automate. But I think that is for the last two three years in the Netherlands where where I see that. And before. Um, the, the, the apps were available or you could do it already, but it was more like the traditional way of using AX was also the way how FNO became implemented. But I see a change there when it when it comes to the power platform. So it's kind of interesting for us on the power app side and the power platform piece of it. It's like being able to approve a workflow through teams. Yeah. You know, like that kind of thing. Um, what are you kind of, what are you seeing? Are you seeing any patterns or like customers typically do these three different functions or what are you seeing in that area? Yeah, it, I think it is more or less maybe about data entry or getting data out of the okay. system. Okay. Um, like the, the portal functionality with apps. Let's say you have an account manager on the road. They need customer information, but the total form of customers in FNO, that's not relevant for them. They want it on their mobile phone and they need quickly some information from FNO and you make an app and they can, can get that information. Or the other way around, you have to enter your, your hours for, for a project, for example. And um, well, maybe... Uh, in your company, it is very specific that that they can do it as quick as possible, so you can make an app to make sure they only see what they need to see and quickly they can do their job. Um, think about approval workflows where you want uh, attachments being available or something. So I think it, it's really related to, or what I see mostly is 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 data getting quickly in FNO or out FNO, and. Also, I see and it's not the power app, but more or less the, the power automate, uh, yeah, automation of processes. And okay. one example there is, is that uh, a company, uh, a lot of people can do purchase requisitions, but they do not have access to the purchase orders based on the licenses in that company. So the finance department was, after confirming the, the PO, the finance department were making print screens of the POs, sending that to the person that did the requisition. 
to tell them this is the purchase order that came from your requisition this is the vendor that that where it was purchased and well that took them a lot of time to make that print screens and send it and well, with power automate it was quite easy to say when the purchase order is confirmed we check at the first line of the PO what is the purchase requisition number. Based on that, we could find the purchase requisition number there. The purchase requisitor could be found there. The user settings, the email could be found. So we could automate that process just to inform them. It was inform yeah. them with the data from FNO without human intervention. So that's really cool. So you're streamlining the process. So you're taking out a yeah. so, so they only take five or five you know minutes or two minutes to do something, but you're, it's a repetitive task yeah. that can be automated. So yeah. it's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I think really the recurring tasks that are coming back on like like daily basis or or multiple times during a day that you can say, okay, is it really necessary to to do this by uh, by a user? Or are the steps available with the data and FNO and can I automate it? I think that, and I think with AI, people will only look more and more to that side of using the system. At this moment, it's really like the people are doing it uh, with the system. And I think that will be turned around like the system is doing this um, with what the people are entering. Yeah, very cool. Great. So you can, uh, the other thing you mentioned was there are a lot of people in Dutch who are trying to get trainings. Yeah. Uh, one of the key questions I get asked mostly on my LinkedIn or other places is, hey, how do I become an FNO consultant? What kind yeah. of background do I need to have? In my opinion, like you mentioned as well, you are not an FNO person, but you became one. So yeah. can you give some, um, some examples of it, especially in Dutch, but also maybe we can speak in general terms about anyone can become a consultant and what would should be their path or what should they uh, try to do uh, yep. so if you can expand on that that would be great yeah yeah of course yeah like like you said already i didn't start as an fno consultant i i started and became an fno consultant at the end um, and if i look back i think one of the things i really did was was uh, focus focus on the processes you want to manage focus on the the main functionalities you need to be aware of um, and i i call it in my articles and in in, in conversation with people creating your own code rack um, because if you are coming into a house and there is no code rack you can have a lot of coats and jackets and it's one messy pile and then try to find your 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 coats um, and if you have a code rack you can structure and that helps you to get organized and and find the things quickly. And I think it's the same when you start working with, with a big ERP system like FNO, you need to make sure that you will find a structure for yourself so you can focus and you can make a learning path. And I think one of the first um, decisions you should make in, in the current uh, FNO application is um, yeah, choose a domain where you want to focus on. Like, do you have a relevance with finance or do you have um, a link with supply chain management or maybe production? Um, because the total system, I see consultants trying to understand the total FNO and they just started. It's so big. Then even I think I'm not sure how, how I will do this. It's so many functionality. So pick the process where you are familiar with or maybe with a study you in my case it was i had a financial background so i i knew the basics of finance and if you know the process then you can understand the tooling so i think first is choose the processes that you are the most familiar with or where you want to work with and then create a learning path how about to learn the tooling um, and make sure that you understand the basics of fno first before you are going to deep dive that processes. Like how is the organizational structure in FNO with legal entities and, and that kind of things. You, you need to understand that. I recently spoke to, to a new consultant that said, I don't understand why there are legal entities. It's just one company. And I said, no, it's, it is one name. But in the company, there are dividings made, uh, um, legal dividings and the system need to follow that. And I could explain about that structure. But the same is for inventory transactions and inventory valuation. I think every consultant doing things in FNO should have at least understanding about that basics because it is almost everywhere. So 
I think making a code rack for yourself with the processes that you want to support, the main things of FNO, and, and well, your learning part of the processes you want to support, make a plan for that. That is important. Without a plan, I see people struggling too much. Yeah, I think that everyone wants to learn everything without like having a, a agenda, right? Sometimes you just need yeah. to set up a plan. If not, and also I think if you don't have a plan, one of the key things I mentioned to people is maybe you need to explore multiple things. You Maybe you like finance, you don't like finance. That's a different yeah. story. But if you yeah. explore and also reach out to people like you or Alicia and others to say, hey, I'm thinking of this, what do you suggest? Uh, and you mentioned MB300, right? One of the key things I'm learning is, I know college students are not on LinkedIn, but I still see some people. And one of the key things through podcast, what I'm learning is people who are looking through college. E when you're in school, it's easy to get certifications. Microsoft helps you get them for free. Yep. <laughs> so yep. if you want help, you just join the community or follow someone yep. like you or Isha or anyone in our group and they can help you understand and just practice. Like if not finance, it will be a CM. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it's good to reach out. I, I, um, um, I think it's, it's a bit time ago. I have to check. Um, well, yeah, October yeah. last year, I'm just checking October last year. I, I wrote an article about, are you also overwhelmed by all the FNO functionalities? Um, and I have a print screen there of AX2. And then the total application had 14 modules. That that was the total acceptor at that moment. And also I opened the accounts payable module. If you look at what you could do in that model, it is like 20% of what you can do in the in the account payable model in FNO. Um, so that article has, has been read a lot. So I think a lot of people started thinking about, I'm going to do this. Uh, it's like I'm going to 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 learn some basics and I will be able to be consultant. And I think within a month, they realize I don't know how to do this. And then indeed, it is important to have that plan, to have the proper sources like uh, the Microsoft sources, maybe people around, but also reach out for help if you need it, because yeah, the application has become too big to just start. And maybe you have to just start to experience this, but that must not take a year because then you will get confused. I think you bring up a good point. I mean, because I've been in this space since 2009 and it has just grown and grown. And you, at one point you've kind of felt like you could keep up with it, no. but now you just cannot. I mean, like I read the release notes and I'm just, I mean, it takes so long. There's so much in there just to read them takes a long time. And I'm like highlighting no. things like, okay, I need to go back and look at that because I have no idea what it just said. No. <laughs> it's something new, right? So do you have any words of advice or would you, uh, how would you recommend that people try to keep up with things or, I mean, or do you, again, would you say specialize in one area and try to just keep up with that? Or what would be your advice to other consultants as far as trying to keep up with things? Well, at least choose. So if it's shoot you and you would say, I can manage the total application from functional or technical perspective, for me, it's okay, but make sure you will have the sources then to, to keep up with all the new functionalities. Um, I think most of the people, but maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not correct, but I think for most of the people, the total functionalities of FNO has become too big. So my first advice will be pick the area, the domain where, where you are going to specialize in. And if you have to, yeah, to see all the new features, features in that part, it's easier than see the total feature list of 60 new features you need to manage. Um, the other thing is if. If I look to to uh, only LinkedIn, where where I'm where I'm checking a lot, a lot of people are sharing about how that new feature will work. So if you have your domain chosen and you follow the right people, you don't need to figure out everything how it work how it works because there are already people that figured it out and they share it. So it saves you time if you follow the right people. Um, so I think following. The people that share relevant information should be high on your priority list because a lot of people think if I have time in the evening and I have energy, then maybe on LinkedIn or on a blog, I will try to find answers. But if you are struggling all day and in the night you find the answer in five minutes by reading an article, 
I think it would be better to do that during the day and being happy and have the solution already. So please don't try to figure out everything by your own, but find the relevant sources that help you by that. Yeah. I found that to be really true too, because one of the things that I've struggled with when I'm reading through like the release notes and stuff is I'm like, why do I care? What's yeah. the business application, right? I read that and I'm like, even like when they came out with tags, right? Yeah. And, and voucher tags, I was thinking, thinking, okay, well, that's great, but why do I care? And then all of a sudden a light bulb went off. I'm like, I care because these accountants are keeping notes and spreadsheets on vouchers every single month and saving yeah. it off and they go through an audit. Well, guess what? Now you can use a tag and you yeah. can go in there and put your note directly on that voucher and you no longer have to keep up with spreadsheets. Yeah. But until that light bulb went off for me, I was anything like, okay, great, but why do I care? But that's the beauty, right, of bloggers and people that are like going through those things. They kind of make it relevant. Yeah. You know, I know you do that in your blog posts very, very often. And it's just like, oh, now I get it. So yeah, I couldn't agree more like who you follow and really who you have in that three to five people, you know, in your, in, in your local circle yep. really has a big impact too. Yeah. Three and I think five. also companies need to organize it because um, when you had AX, uh, it was like, well, companies that are using AX are updating when they want, because you, you got the update and you choose, do I want that update? Yes or no. And now, uh, yeah, you have a cloud system and, and okay, in 2024, it became four updates a year instead of nine or 10, but still you will get the updates in within some months. And um, I think also in companies, I advise more and more, Some sometimes they don't even know what feature management is. And then I say, okay, I have to intervene because you should know. Um, and then I said, I think also internally in organizations, key user teams should come together on a regular basis to discuss the new features and is it relevant for our company or what if the future becomes mandatory? What is the effect on our company um, automatically enabled? What does it mean for us? So I think in companies, but also in the, yeah, let's say the Microsoft partners where a lot of consultants work, you can divide that. Why should one person or each person uh, investigate everything. If you have a team of 20 people, please divide in 20 pieces and present to each other. So it has also to do with organizing, but still realizing that you are working in with an application that will have continuous development. So you need to find a way to keep up to date because if you will stop for a year, it will be very hard after a year to get by when there are like four new updates already. Yeah. Yeah, and I cannot agree more on that uh, pro pro proactive quality updates and feature management, right? I, I, I've i worked with, I, I was consulting and I had, I've seen like six companies and I started explaining everyone what it means. <laughs> How does it work? Because they were just upgrading and like, oh, I'm up to date. I'm like, yeah. are you really up to date? Because if you didn't enable the features, you're yeah. not up to date. Uh, and what I've learned was, that was so frustrating to me. And that was one of the reasons I started the YouTube video. <laughs> yeah. My first video was on that because I'm like, I'm repeating the same thing every time. Might as well just post it on the video. Yeah. And then maybe it will help other people. Yeah, great. Yeah. And I think that kind of key concept, that is what I also meant when I talked about what should new consultants do when they want to start in a working area. Make sure you understand that key principles of how to work with Evernote, because it doesn't matter if you are functional or technical, or if you are a finance consultant or supply chain management consultant, feature management at some point will come into your face. So you have to deal with it. So that kind of basic principles should that you should always be familiar with that. Also, as key user team of a company. Yeah, no, that's how, and that's when I learned that, okay, I have things that I can share with other people who are way more experienced than me, but they don't care. Their day to day has much more things. Yeah. And I also learned like how uh, developers were not part of the feature management. I'm like, mm -hmm. they should be the key part of it because the developers can actually tell you what's happening behind the scenes, yeah. if it will impact any of your other customizations you have. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons I kind of started the video. Uh, but uh, yeah, going back, what you were mentioning was very important to me in terms of uh, uh, like not only just 
finding a niche or finding something. Uh, you mentioned something like, uh, Alicia mentioned tax, right? One of the key things for me is uh, when you want to follow people, sometimes I, we are doing all global implementations now, yep. and I had to do SFT reporting, SAFT reporting in Europe, right? It's a standard for Europe, but not for US. I never had an idea, but I found a article through someone in uk so if you are working on a topic i really agree with you that instead of spending all day trying to figure on your own yeah. just spend that five minutes in the beginning of your day and if yeah. not reach out to someone like if i know you're from i'm working on a project in netherlands yeah. i cannot ask you for solution but i can yeah. at least reach like you yeah. can, hey how does sft saft reporting work in netherlands and you might guide me to the right resource yeah and i think that's that's very important because um also that there are so many different regulations in the world and standards in the world you will never or at least i will never be able to understand them all and why should I learn all of these regulations and templates if I will never use it? But if I'm in that situation, if I know the basics of FNO and I will find the right input, I, I will know how to use them. But then you have to, yeah, to be in contact with the right people. And I think 80% of the consultants are willing to help each other. And yeah, that's really the community. Um, if if you help someone on day one, maybe somebody else helps you on day 41. Yeah, that's that's how we can can do the job and I think it makes it so much easier for everybody instead of trying to figure it out all by ourselves um, and also I think um, finding the right sources and save them I, I recently asked a colleague about what are sources that that um, that we can share internally also then we as, as company we are thinking about okay well what sources should people use if they have questions and he sent me an email with like 60s websites with by each website this is a blog of that person with that topics uh, these topics this is a blog from that company they describe these topics and i really was like whoa yeah this this is great so he by every time he found something that helped him he saved it immediately so he has his own library that he if he has a question he immediately f efficiency can check what is the source that i can use to do it and yeah, I, I only could say uh, you did a great job. That helps a lot. And then I think uh, um, then it's not necessary to know everything. If you know 80% of the process, the last 20% is always customer specific because in FNO you have so many configurations. Each customer is using it different, differently. But if you know 80% of the process or 85% or 90, that last 10% can be done with your knowledge and the last investigation. Because lately, I, there, there was in a training, people ask me, oh, how is that process done? I said, yeah, you can do it like this, you can do it like that. But if you enable that parameter, it is like this. And they were looking at me like, but okay, but how many, how many variants are there? And I said, yeah, you have to imagine there is always another variance in FNO. Because if you have learned the five you know now, then somebody else is telling you there is a parameter in some country and there is a sixth way how you can do it. So, but if you know the basics, well, then you will always come to that variant that you need. Yeah. No, and the other thing also, like like you mentioned, someone had that list. And one of the key things, like the way I, like you mentioned, Alicia and Ramit and Saurabh and others in one of your posts, one of the key things for me was when I replied was like, it takes effort for you to save that list and then share it with someone, right? Yeah. And also sometimes you need to acknowledge that. So I really want to thank you for like, at least one of your posts, I'm going to link that in the video description here, but about whom to follow in the D365 space. That yeah. was a very important, like a, it looks very simple and easy, but it came across through your experience of watching all these people share the content. So it was a lot of time on you. Uh, yeah, and I must say, I think I'm even quite the most proud of that article if you looked at that all the things I shared because it was really like, I don't know when it was, but I was on an evening at home and I thought, why on LinkedIn there is no place where you can find all that relevant people that share things about FNO. So I had only one prerequisite, it must be about FNO. That, that is what it needs to be. And I tried to find and I could not find it. Maybe there was already, I could not find it. So I thought I'm going to make that list because um, 
it is not my job to share FNO. It is a job of so many people doing it. And there is so much relevant information that we can use. And I thought, I want to create one place where you can find all people that I advise you to follow. And I must say, I've updated it for three times now because I also asked, if you know someone, please send me. So sometimes I get a new message. Why is that person not on the list? And then I'm looking, oh, yeah, it's FNO. Yeah, relevant. So I'll put it on the list. Um, it is also an article that, that by far has the most views. Um, so that's also nice to see that, that that's for me, again, the community. Let's connect with each other, because if you are connected with each other, you can help each other when, when it's necessary. No, so I can, that, I can only invite people to, to follow relevant people, start sharing by yourself, but make sure that, that we are able to find each other when you need the help. One of the things I really appreciated about the post, and by the way, I was very honored that you put me on there, by the way. <laughs> but one of the things I really appreciated about the post is the fact of you're sending the tone of we are a community, we are not competitors. Yep. And I think in the consulting world, lots of times it can come across of like, oh, well, I'm I'm good because of what I know. If I share what I know, somehow it diminishes my value. And I think that's really that fear factor playing in yep. because for me, it's the pie is super big. There's enough room for all of us. So yeah. whenever you're giving out information, it's about sharing and because it just makes us all stronger, right? And it, it yep. builds up the Microsoft community. So I really appreciate yeah. that. And I think if you look at the candy shop, if you give away some candies, that is not because then you must be feared that you miss the candies, but if people realize how good that candies are, they come back and start buying. So it's not why I do it, but I don't think that based on the fact that I started writing that my market value became lower or that the right. Emprise Academy became less relevant because that right. knowledge was, was findable now. No, we have more questions because people say we, we have seen that article, we need that, but we need guidance to implement it. Mm -hmm. uh, so at that end, I think that kind of fears, uh, you don't need to have them. And to be honest, I think a lot of people that say, um, uh, I have the knowledge, yeah, why should you think that way? It is not you, it's not you only. And right. it's nice that you know it, but you also learned it. And maybe someone else learned you too. And I think in some cases, it, it's, it's like the fear that people think, yeah, but what if I think I know a lot, but if I share it, maybe it was not that much as people expected. But also then I think, yeah, we are all human. Why be so difficult to each other? It's not exactly. necessary. Absolutely. No. And also, I, I always believe like once we start sharing each other and show that community, uh, one of the reasons for this podcast or anything that I'm interested in is also sometimes there is a lot of fear with people that, OK, it might be very hard. We, we always see successful people at their top and then we don't mm -hmm. understand that you started without any accept knowledge. You are reading through the book, right? So one of yep. the goals for me with this podcast is not only that you can reach all these people, but when you know their behind the scenes story, you feel like, oh, it's not that scary to achieve that. Someone wants no. to be an MCT, they can look at it and say, I can become an MCT because you can do it or they can reach out yeah. to you saying, what does it mean? Or even for MVP, like it came for you without any expectations, but yep. you were just doing your job. And someone who wants to understand how to become an MVP, they will learn from you that if you just keep sharing, it will fall in your place. So that's the stories I want to bring through this podcast as well. Yeah, so and that's great. End, just, yeah. yeah, sorry. No, before we end, I want to just give each one the space. So UK, is there anything that we didn't ask that you want to share? Or is there something that you want to spread to the community? Community. Not to put you on the spot, but it's, yeah. it's just to say thank you for. I really want to say thank you for your time. I know it's uh, it's. I changed some time earlier, but I really appreciate it, and we really enjoy your post. We really enjoy the uh, togetherness you bring to the community. Uh, I I wanted to bring Alicia as well, and next one I want to bring someone else, and maybe you could be one of the co-hosts for me because I want to bring more people and listening each one's story helps. So yeah, I would love to see what you want to say so we can end the podcast and really thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for organizing this, because I think indeed what you say, being connected more and more is is helping a lot of people and also yeah, 
it's nice to see each other. It's nice to be able to share things with each other. It's, it is nice to be connected with people all over the world. It doesn't matter for me where people come from. Um, so I think, um, yeah, if I have advice, I think we have discussed a lot. Um, uh, but my advice will be, uh, yeah, let's connect with each other and, and um, yeah, share, start caring if you are able to start learning if you need to. Don't be too afraid, but at the moment you need to reach for help because the system has become too big to, to just try around and don't find your way. So when necessary, search for, for the right guidance and make sure that people can help you. Well, I say to make your own code track that, that makes sure that your knowledge will not be a messy pile, but can be used effectively for yourself and the customers you have to serve. Okay. Alicia, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I just want to say thank you for for being on here today because truly I've followed you for a long time, but I obviously never met you um, in person of sorts through, through a screen even. So putting a face with a name and getting to see you as a person is is fantastic. And I hope a lot of people will watch this and take away your your character of how you're doing your work because it's not just about being recognized or doing things to get certain number of likes or whatever. It's really the heart of it is about giving back. Yeah. And it's about speaking to a younger version of yourself. And I think you demonstrated that today. So thank you. And it's a pleasure to meet you. And, and um, hopefully we'll get to do this many more times. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, it was indeed the pleasure to meet you both. Uh, the first time we see each other in person uh, or at least uh, with Richard, yeah. with the faces by it. So I really enjoyed it. So thank you for uh, inviting me. And uh, yeah, let's keep in touch and see what we can do next. Yeah, and like he mentioned, I think it's all about connecting to people virtually, yeah. if not anyway. So at least through podcasts, you got to know a bit about UK and how to pronounce his name, maybe. <laughs> if it was, it was very good. Yeah, and then, but also for me, the goal here is to like learn from each one. So please follow UK, please follow Alicia on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions, like they both mentioned, they're very open. Please reach out, say hi, say thank you, uh, whatever it takes. So thank you so much, everyone, for watching. So thank you, UK. Thank you, Alicia. Bye.